A land of clear blue lakes, romantic palaces, cool green forests, inspiring cathedrals, high mountain peaks, and warm sandy beaches. Of heroes and legends from the past that lend color and dimension to the present. International Video Network welcomes you on this video visit to Poland, a proud heritage. Poland owes much of its heritage to its geography. The events that shape the history also shape the borders. Situated in Central Europe, Poland is bordered by the Baltic Sea on the north, the Soviet Union to the east, Czechoslovakia to the south, and the German Democratic Republic to the west. Through centuries and countless wars, Poland's boundaries have expanded and contracted many times. They even disappeared altogether during one bleak period. It's a bit ironic that today they're about the same as they were 800 years ago. Over 37 million people live within these borders, and of those, 1.6 million live in the capital city of Warsaw. Warsaw is the seat of Polish government and the center of Polish culture. It is a city of broad, modern avenues and narrow cobblestone streets. It has been called the Paris of the East, the invincible city, and the city of peace. And in some ways, it is all of these. But to understand the true nature of Warsaw, one must understand her people. Although over half of her citizens were born after the Second World War, all Varsovians, as they're called, take great pride in their city's rich history. It is here, on the banks of the Vistula River, that Warsaw was born. Legend has it that a mermaid appeared to a fisherman named Wars and told him that on this spot, a prosperous and beautiful town would rise. Today, this symbol of Warsaw, the siren with sword and shield, guards the city, an embodiment of the city's motto, defying the storm. On August 1st, 1944, after nearly five years of Nazi occupation, the people of Warsaw began a valiant resistance against their oppressors. For 63 days and nights, they managed to fight tanks and bombs with rifles and pistols. Hitler, outraged at this attempt, ordered the complete destruction of the city. Demolition squads went to work dynamiting and burning everything in sight. When the liberating armies marched into Warsaw in 1945, they found an empty city of smoking, smoldering ruins. The survivors, a mere one-third of the pre-war population, had been forced out of the city by the Nazis. But like a phoenix rising from the ashes, the people of Warsaw immediately began rebuilding their beloved city. Eager to recreate everything exactly as it was, survivors pulled out old photographs and blueprints. Their most important points of reference were 18th century paintings by the Venetian artist Canaletto. The old town we see today is a result of their labor of love. Faithful reconstructions of buildings dating as far back as the Middle Ages once again line the streets near Market Square. As in the old days, this is still the social center of town, with families and friends strolling the cobblestone streets, and artists and musicians adding colorful sights and sounds to life in the city.
Remnants of the Barbican, the old city wall that once surrounded the town, can still be seen today. It was built in the 16th century to defend the city against foreign invaders. At the edge of Old Town, in Castle Square, is Warsaw's oldest monument, the statue of King Sigmund III Vasa, at the top of a tall and slender column. Erected in 1644, it honors the king who transferred the seat of power from Krakow to Warsaw in 1586. King Sigmund set up residence here at the royal castle. Most of the construction and later remodeling took place between the 14th and 18th centuries. Like nearly everything else in Warsaw, it was destroyed by the Nazis during World War II. It took over 25 years before restoration could begin, and the work was financed entirely by voluntary contributions. Throughout the centuries, it has been the home of kings and the site of historic events. It has welcomed dignitaries from around the world, and serves today as a museum and a symbol of the Polish character. Castle Square marks the beginning of the Royal Route, one of Warsaw's major avenues, lined with palaces, embassies, churches, and museums. Also located along this route is Warsaw University, the alma mater of Frederick Chopin, Tadeusz Kostruszko, and Madame Curie. A short detour off the royal route leads to Saxon Gardens and the tomb of the unknown soldier. Every Sunday at noon, a full military band participates in the ceremony of the changing of the guard. Uniformed soldiers weren't the only ones who fought to save their homeland in World War II. During the Warsaw Uprising, men, women, and children joined together in their fight for freedom, and 200,000 of them died. This monument is a tribute to the smallest soldiers of that conflict, the children of Warsaw. Today, children in Warsaw have the opportunity to do what children should do, like spend a Sunday in the park with the family. Wajenki Park is Warsaw's favorite spot for families, and also the site of the lovely palace on the lake. This 18th century palace was the summer home for Stanislaw August Poniatowski, last of the Polish kings. It was built and decorated by Poland's finest artists of the period, and is recognized as one of the best examples of Polish neoclassical architecture. Two years after the palace was finished, King Stanislaw had a theater built, modeled after the stone amphitheater at Herculaneum with its stage situated on the water, 
The park's surroundings provide a natural backdrop for summertime performances. A short stroll across the grounds and through the gardens leads to the monument dedicated to the famous Polish-born composer, Frédéric Chopin. On summer Sunday afternoons, Chopin's romantic music floats through the air as piano recitals are given near his statue. Chopin grew up in Warsaw, but he was actually born about 30 miles outside the city, in this house at Zelazowa Wola. Often in the summertime, he would come back to spend his holidays here. His last visit was in the summer of 1830, when he was 20 years old. His home is now a museum, and each year from June to September, the best pianists in the world come here to play his music. Warsaw's royal route ultimately leads to Wielanow Palace, six miles from the center of town. Wielanow was built for King Jan Sobieski, who became the hero of the day when in 1683 he defeated the invading Turks at Vienna and thereby put an end forever to the Turkish threat to Central Europe. Originally, King Jan's country residence, Wielanow is considered to be Poland's most beautiful Baroque palace, a Polish Versailles. Subsequent owners in following centuries added their own touches with gardens, statues, and additional rooms. But reminders of Sobieski and his great victory can still be seen today. Although it is still used for important state occasions from time to time, the palace serves mainly as a museum recreating the world of the Polish nobility during the 18th and 19th centuries. King Jan wanted to encourage native artists and craftsmen, so he authorized a royal studio where they could work. Of course, that also provided him with the skilled labor he needed to decorate his palace. Their workmanship is evident in every detail, from the windows and doors to the frescoes and painted ceilings. But homes for former kings and quaint medieval squares aren't the only things Warsaw has to offer. Dominating the skyline is the city's tallest building, the Palace of Culture and Science. Built in 1955, its many statues represent the Russian working man, a fitting theme considering it was a gift from the Soviet Union. Its 38 stories house scientific and cultural institutions, cinemas, theaters, publishing houses, and restaurants. <laughs> restaurants in Warsaw, as in all of Poland, are known for their well-prepared, authentic, and inexpensive cuisine. The helpings are plentiful, and the ingredients hearty and filling. Definitely not the country for dieters, Poland offers its visitors a taste of traditional old world cooking and contemporary specialties.
A little known fact about Poland is its tradition of breeding and training of horses. Polish horses have been winning awards internationally for over a hundred years. These beautiful animals can be seen at various stud farms, like this one about an hour's drive from Warsaw in the Polish countryside. A quarter of Poland's surface is covered by woodlands. In the east, near the Soviet border, is the largest and last primeval forest in Central Europe, the Awobieja. The Awobieja forest encompasses 250,000 acres, and while most of it lies within the Soviet Union, Poland has turned her part into a national park. Rangers walk the trails on a regular basis to make sure that park rules are obeyed. These regulations were established so that nature could again have the chance to follow its own course. No flowers can be picked, no motor vehicles are allowed, and all wildlife is protected. The most famous of the protected species are the Jubere, Europe's only surviving wild bison. A four-hour excursion by horse-drawn cart is the best way to see the park. And although visitors will find a hotel and a tourist hostel nearby, accommodations are limited. Located in southern Poland, at the foot of Wawel Hill, is what many people consider the most beautiful of all Polish cities, Krakow, the only major city that wasn't destroyed by Hitler's bombs. Krakow's old world charm is still intact, from the cobblestone streets to the spires that reach for the sky. It was the capital of Poland for over three centuries and home of Polish kings until the end of the 1500s. During this period, Krakow was known throughout Europe as a center of art and culture. At the heart of the city is one of the great market squares of Europe. It's cafes, flower vendors, fruit vendors, arts, crafts, and music. Make this the hub of Krakow's public life. Add to that the arcade of the Cloth Hall, a flock of pigeons, and it's a bit like the Piazza San Marco in Venice.
An Italian influence is also apparent in the city's royal residence, Vavil Castle. The courtyard was designed by two of Italy's most talented Renaissance architects and is now the setting for open-air concerts. Seventy-one of the interior rooms have been restored and exhibit exquisite pieces of art. The most famous is a collection of 136 Flemish tapestries from the 16th and 17th centuries. Commissioned by King Sigmund Augustus, they depict mostly biblical stories, although some with hunting themes have also survived. This collection is reputed to be the largest of its kind in Europe today. The most unusual sight is found in the Chamber of Deputies. Carved into the ceiling are 30 wooden heads belonging to members of the court circa 1535. In the royal treasury room, the jagged sword used in the coronation of all Polish kings is on display, as well as silver plates, jeweled goblets, lightly armor, and royal robes. Across the courtyard from the castle is Wawel Cathedral, surrounded by 18 chapels of various styles. The former administrative head of this great church was Cardinal Karol Wojtyla, better known today as Pope John Paul II. Beginning in 1320, this is where every Polish king was crowned and where most are buried. It is actually the third cathedral to stand on this spot. To walk among the tombs and monuments is to take a journey through Poland's past in the company of kings, queens, and heroes. One of Krakow's favorite heroes was an ordinary watchman in the tower of St. Mary's Church back in 1241. Catching sight of invading Tartars, he sounded his trumpet in alarm. Suddenly, in mid-tune, an enemy arrow pierced his throat, thus making him immortal. To this day, his haunting melody is repeated every hour on the hour and broadcast every day at noon on Polish radio, always ending on the very same note as it did that day long ago. Within the cathedral itself is a masterpiece of medieval wood carving, the triptych created by Witz Depicting the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin, the figures of Mary and the Apostles appear almost lifelike. Their robes seem to drape like the softest cloth and glisten as if made of golden thread. Just outside of Krakow is a salt mine which dates back nearly a thousand years. The largest mine of its kind in Europe, it is still being worked today. Reaching down nine levels and a depth of over one half mile, the total length of its galleries exceeds 90 miles. Although most of the mine is undergoing restoration for the next few years, one chamber at 735 feet below ground remains unchanged. Because of its unique microclimate, this area serves as a sanatorium for people with respiratory illnesses. Jestem tutaj wraz z swoimi chłopcami 220 metrów pod powierzchnią ziemi w bardzo starej kopalni soli w Wieliczce. Znajdujemy się obecnie w komorze, która jest już dawno wyeksploatowana i tutaj leczymy się. To znaczy, leczymy tutaj górne drogi oddechowe, chłopcy leczą się samym powietrzem. Nie jest to w takim razie zbyt skomplikowane. Now, 
Not far from Krakow is the little town of Oshvienshim. Once a pleasant village set among hills and woods, it came to the world's attention after World War II under its German name, Auschwitz. Auschwitz, the name itself almost sounds like someone crying in pain. It was the largest of Hitler's death camps, designed to exterminate 15,000 people a day. Today, it is a national museum dedicated to the four million men, women, and children from all over Europe who were imprisoned here. To visit the camp is to be deeply affected by the horrors committed against humanity. Gas chambers, crematoria, firing squads. This camp alone was responsible for the deaths of three million people. A tour of Auschwitz is not a pleasure trip. Yet nearly everyone who has ever been here agrees that it should be seen, just to make sure that nothing like it is ever allowed to happen again. A short drive west of Krakow is the village of Wadowice, where Pope John Paul II was born. In the town market square stands a church that was built in the 15th century, while nearby is the former home of the Pope, now a museum devoted to his life and work. Pope John Paul II was born Karol Wojciewa in 1920. As a boy, he read philosophy, wrote poetry, and played soccer. During World War II, he joined the underground and fought against the Nazis. After the war, he was ordained as a priest, and in 1978, became the first Pole ever to be chosen as Pope. Carpathian Mountains, which outline Poland's southern border with Czechoslovakia, form a vast and enchanting landscape. The highest peaks are the Tatras, where steep granite walls rise above thick pine forests and fertile valleys. The entire Tatra region has been declared a national park. Within its protective confines, there is an abundance of natural beauty waiting to be explored. Mountain streams, hiking trails, and hundreds of lakes dot the landscape. The largest lake is Morske Oko, surrounded by rugged peaks. Morske Oko means eye of the sea which has to do with local legend, claiming that the lake is connected to the Adriatic by subterranean passageways. In fact, when the breeze blows just right and the sunlight dances on the water's surface, it does seem like this lake could have some kind of magical connection. Drawn by the fresh mountain air and unique scenery, many travelers from neighboring countries come here to visit. In fact, the border runs right along the top of the Tatra range. Northern slopes are Polish, southern ones are Czechoslovakian.
In addition to being ideal for camping, hiking, and climbing, this mountain region is also the place to come for a taste of Highland folklore. The popular resort of Zakopane, at the foot of the Tatras, was originally just a small mountain village. Nowadays, it welcomes more than two and a half million visitors a year. The Carpathians are divided into a number of smaller chains by several mountain passes and rivers. The dramatic Dunayets River Gorge, cutting its way through the Pianinias, is a spectacular example of this. A raft trip down the river provides a unique way to enjoy the scenery. The rafts are hollowed out tree trunks and carry about a dozen people. They are guided by local mountaineers dressed in the colorful outfits of their ancestors. The three hour trip is like a fairy tale cruise. Rural areas are home to about one-third of the Polish people. Over half of the land is devoted to agriculture, with most of it producing grain, such as wheat, barley, and rye. Seventy-five percent of the farms in Poland are privately owned, like this one at the foot of the Tatras. This region is considered to have the best farmland in the country. While farmers are allowed to have up to 247 acres, the average farm is only about 12 acres, usually consisting of cows, chickens, and a horse or two. wasn't the first time that foreign invaders have forced themselves upon the Polish people. Defending her land and her way of life from invading armies has been a recurring theme throughout Polish history. These ruins are a testament to that legacy. Called the Eagle's Nests, 
These were originally castles built in the 14th century to defend Poland's border at the time. Along the Eagle's Nest Trail are 14 medieval fortresses, beginning near Krakow and ending in Częstochowa. With Warsaw, the heart of contemporary Poland, and Krakow, its historical and cultural center, it is Częstochowa that claims the honor of being the nation's spiritual capital. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people make a pilgrimage to the city. Their destination is the church and monastery of the Pauline Fathers, founded in 1382 on Bright Hill. It is also the home of Poland's most sacred icon, the Black Madonna. In 1665, when nearly all of Poland was being overrun by invading Swedish armies, this monastery bravely withstood attack. Success was due, they say, to the presence of the Black Madonna's portrait. The scars on her cheeks are said to have come from the sword of an enemy soldier when he tried to steal the painting. Legend says that when he couldn't move it, he slashed the face and blood then trickled down from the wounds. Over the years, the monastery has had several additions including this lofty tower, which overlooks the entire town, as well as the surrounding countryside. Assumption Day in August welcomes the largest crowds of the year. Many of the pilgrims make the journey entirely on foot, sometimes traveling as long as nine days. With 95% of Poland's population Roman Catholic, it ranks as one of the nation's most popular ceremonies. In the town of Biskupin, local history goes back further than anywhere else in Poland, back to 550 BC to be exact. In 1933, a school principal on a field trip with his students discovered some sharp wooden stakes sticking out of the ground. This led to an archeological excavation that eventually uncovered a fortified island settlement over 2,500 years old. Thirty-five thousand wooden stakes formed protective walls around 100 huts and parallel streets. The entrance to the settlement was through this gate at the end of a causeway over 100 yards long. Here in the town of Gniezno, over a thousand years ago, King Mieszko became the first ruler of Poland. He unified the various Polish tribes and made peace with the Holy Roman Emperor. And in doing so, the Polish nation began to emerge. Gniezno was the new nation's very first capital. Inside Gniezno's monumental Gothic cathedral is the city's most important treasure, the doors of St. Wojciech. The bronze doors depict 18 scenes from the life of the saint who passed through here in the 10th century on his way to convert the northern pagans. Just when he seemed to be making progress, they murdered him. King Boleslaw the Brave was forced to pay a ransom in gold for the return of the holy man's remains.
St. Wojciech's final resting place is here above the high altar of the cathedral in a splendid silver reliquary. During medieval times, the city of Turun, here on the Vistula River, was a powerful trading center. But in later years, when trade routes shifted to the larger seaports, Turun gradually lost its influence. Today, although the town's stature in the outside world has dwindled, the old world magic lives on. The Gothic town hall and its red brick tower stand high above their surroundings, living images of the 14th century. Torun is known primarily as the birthplace of Nicholas Copernicus. The great astronomer was born in this house in 1473, which is now a museum. It was Copernicus who first put forth the theory that the Earth revolved around the Sun and that the turning of the Earth's axis accounted for the apparent rising and setting of the stars. He is known as the father of modern astronomy. The University of Turun has been named in honor of the prominent astronomer. Turun managed to avoid the destruction that was inflicted on most of Poland during World War II. These 14th century town walls most likely had no part in defending it. But somehow, the town does feel like it is blessed with a protective shell, as if time marching onward has decided to bypass this little town on the Vistula. Downstream from Turun on the river Nogat is one of Europe's mightiest medieval fortresses, Malborg built by the order of Teutonic Knights. For 150 years, this powerful group ruled over northern Poland. Castles built to defend their conquered territory were once scattered all the way from Prussia to Transylvania. Malbork was the strongest fortress in this chain. In 1410, Poland joined forces with Lithuania to fight back against the Teutonic Order. At the historic Battle of Grunwald, Poland won a great victory and the Teutonic Knights were eventually driven from the land. A tour through Malbrook explores cobblestone passageways, quiet courtyards, and vast feasting halls, ramparts and chapels and dungeons. In the summertime, this courtyard becomes a staging ground for musical and theatrical performances. Getting away to the unspoiled wilderness of the lake country is how many Polish families choose to spend their holidays. Covering the country's northeast corner are thousands of lakes, carved and filled by a retreating glacier eons ago. They vary in size from tiny little pools to the largest lake in Poland, Lake Sznardwy. 50 square miles of water and constant breezes make this lake a sailor's paradise. Spending a day on the water with the wind at one's back and hardly a sound except for the flapping of sails is the way of life in the land of a thousand lakes. Another popular vacation spot is the Baltic coast. 
sandy beaches, mild weather, and fashionable resorts have been drawing people here for over a hundred years. Camping sites are plentiful and convenient, and in some places, pine forests come all the way down to the shore. Swimming, boating, and sunbathing are the first orders of business in this part of Poland. Small ships run up and down the coast, stopping at various points of interest. The statki nasze, które pływają tu po wodach zatoki są oblegane, mają liczną frekwencję. Zawsze bardzo chętnie i bardzo serdecznie zapraszamy wszystkich turystów, zarówno z kraju, jak i za granicy. Stanowi to naprawdę niezapomniane wrażenie. Most of the population along here live in one of the three sister cities, Gdańsk, Gdynia, and Sopot. Gdańsk, formerly known by its German name, Danzig, is one of Poland's oldest cities. Throughout its turbulent history, it has been ruled in turn by Germans, Prussians, and Poles. Once the greatest port on the Baltic, Gdańsk allows Poland maritime access to the rest of Europe. It was during the period between 1454 and 1793 that the city enjoyed its greatest prosperity. Evidence of its role as a major European port during the Renaissance can be seen down every street, from the marketplaces to the churches to the rolls of the burger houses. Keeping the Renaissance atmosphere alive, the city hosts a Dominican fair every year. For two weeks in August, artists from all over Poland come here to display their work. Artists and craftsmen have always done well in Gdansk. Beginning in the Middle Ages and on through the Renaissance, this elaborate artist's mansion was the meeting place for the Artisans Guild. Standing in front of the artist's mansion is the most famous fountain in all of Poland, the Neptune Fountain. Cast in 1615, this beautiful bronze sea god stands as a symbol of Gdansk and its connection with Neptune's kingdom. But while some tribute is paid to a pagan god like Neptune, the real attention has always been given to the Catholic faith, represented by St. Mary's Church. It's the largest Gothic church in the Baltic region, with room for 25,000 worshippers. The church towers offer a panoramic view over all of Gdansk. In 1980, these three metal crosses were erected outside the Lenin shipyard, the birthplace of solidarity. Upon them, the struggle of Polish workers has been commemorated in bronze. A 
around the corner from Gdansk is Sopot, which began as a spa in the 1600s. It reached its heyday in the 19th century, and the villas and grand old hotels from that era are still accommodating vacationers to this day. One of the best ways to pass a few lazy hours here is to stroll down the pier. It's as long as six football fields and makes a good spot to sunbathe or just watch the ships roll in. From the sandy Baltic shore to the rugged Carpathian peaks, across fertile countryside and along winding blue rivers. Throughout its thousand year history, Poland has fought invading armies and built lasting monuments. She has given us a scientist that changed the way we looked at heaven and heroes that have changed the course of history. The music of Chopin, which stirs the heart and comforts the soul. An appreciation of the past and a faith in the future. Poland, truly the home of a proud heritage. Thank you.